shooting said the Bible was wrote by a white man, so what? We were looking for the message, it's, not the message. It's, it's not so what, because the Bible was not written by the white man. Did, okay. did you learn that today, that the Bible's not written by the white man? Okay, King James wrote that Bible, right? No, he did not write the Bible. Okay. King James was a king, like, uh, who's the president right now? What's his name? Like Joe Biden is the president right now. King James was the president or the ruler at that time, and he authorized the Bible to be translated. The Bible was already written. No, 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 no. Two completely different time frames. Council of Nicaea, you're talking about Constantine, about 323 AD after Christ died. You're talking about King James, a thousand, twelve hundred years later, 1619, a black man that ruled in Europe authorized the translation so that other black people just like you could understand the Bible in your language. That's King James. He wasn't white, he wasn't a homosexual, and he didn't write the Bible. All right, give me Psalm 68 and 11. What is my language? All praises. Good question. Read that. The book of Psalms, chapter 68, verse 11. The Lord gave the word. Who gave it? The Lord gave the word. So this book right here was given by the Lord. It was given by the Most High God. He inspired men to write his words on paper, into books. Read. Great was the company of those that published it. So what we read about is people that published God's writings. So uh, Moses was a publisher. Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Amos, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Malachi, Haggai, Obadiah, the Apostle Paul. All of these were publishers of God's words. And all these men that you read about in this book look just like you. That's right. All right. So you, you ask the question, well, what is your language? Your original language is Hebrew. But we lost our language. We lost our original language because we fell into captivity. We fell into sin. We fell into slavery. Now we speak the languages of our slave masters, our oppressors. Okay, but I thought that the Bible would be the environment. I thought oh, one man right here. Oh, uh, what's your name again, bro? I ain't seen you in a minute. Jim. Jim, yeah, my man Jim. Jim always comes through. Every time I grab the mic, I see Jim. I see Jim. I see Jim. But I ain't seen Jim at the school. Where you been, Jim? Right, right, oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah, you got the long talk. Right, right, hey, right. hey, my brother right here. No, I'm here for you. I got you. No, I was just saying what's up to my brother. I ain't seen him in about a year. I ain't seen him in about a year. But the point that we bringing out to our brothers, the point that we bringing out to our brothers is that we got to repent. That's what, that's what we want everybody to walk away from here understanding that we got to repent. Let's go to Acts 3, 19. Yeah. Aramaic, that's, that's a language that Christ spoke. All of our original language was Hebrew. Hebrew, the original Hebrew. Back in the time, we were called Hebrews before we were called anything else. That's right. All right, but check this out. This is what I want you to walk away from here understanding. Read. The book of Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent ye therefore. And be converted. That's what you gotta walk away from here understanding. What's your name, my brother? What's your name? Sam? Alright, Sam, the scriptures, the black men that published God's words told you to do what? Repent ye. You gotta repent. So there's a lifestyle that you've been living up until this point, and you gotta change that lifestyle. You used to live one way, now you gotta start living a different way. Right. Repent what? Repent ye, therefore and be converted so you must be converted the only thing that's going to convert the so-called black man that was manufactured in the lab called america is god's laws that's right. because the black man is an adulterer he's a liar he's a thief he's a whoremonger he's a breaker of god's commandments a breaker of god's holidays a breaker of god's sabbath day and the only thing that can change that is the laws of god read that your sins may be blotted out. My brother Sam, you in the midst of sin right now, but you need those sins to be blotted out. That's right. Because the consequence of the sins that you're in the midst of right now is your own life. Your own life has to be taken for the sins that you're in the midst of. That's why the scripture says blotting what? <clears throat> Excuse me. 
that your sins may be blotted out. You want your sins to be blotted out. The sins that you used to live in, the midst of, you don't want the Most High God to have to judge you for those sins. Because when that judgment comes, that judgment is death. Read. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The times of refreshing, when Christ comes to the earth, he's going to refresh the earth from what? From sin. So if you're still in the midst of sin, what's going to happen to you? Mm. You're going to get refreshed. That's right. And let me show you what that refreshment is. Bring it out. In the midst of your sin. Give me Romans 6 and 23. I'm going to show you the biblical definition for refreshment that the Lord is bringing. All right? Check this out. The book of Romans chapter 6 verse 23. Uh -huh. For the wages of sin. Remember, it said hey. your sins got to be blotted out. Hey, check this out, bro. Hey, my brother, don't get distracted. Don't get distracted. Huh? You got distracted. I got you. I got you. We reeling you back in. We out here fishing. It's a lot of fish in the sea. We trying to see which one coming on the boat. Read. For the wages of sin is death. You hear that, Sam? What's the wages of sin? Death. Now go back. But keep reading. Keep reading. <laughs> For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Right, so when that refreshment comes from Christ, he's going to either give you one or the other. You either get death or you get eternal life. You get a question? A spiritual death. Your, your soul, your spirit is going to be destroyed. We can't even really describe to you what's going to happen to you. I don't know exactly what's going to happen to you. But it's going to be the opposite of what you want to happen to you. The worst thing that you can imagine happening to you on this earth doesn't compare to what's going to happen to you if you got to be judged for your sins. What? Because you never understood what grace is. For God to be gracious, you got to understand what that grace is. I'm going to explain it to you. I'm going to let God explain to you what the grace is, all right? Check this out. We are Titus, right? Check this out, man. Check this out. The book of Titus, chapter 2, verse 11. And we want to let the... Before we go there, give me uh, uh, chapter 4 and 11. What was that? Uh, second... Uh, the oracles of God, Second yeah, Timothy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the reason we want to let this speak, we want to let the Bible speak, is because many men have used their own words to try to speak on God's behalf. Our oh, God is a gracious God. Well, what does that mean? We want the Bible to define these words. Read that. The book of First Peter, chapter four, verse eleven. Uh -huh. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Uh -huh. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God gave us. So God gave us the ability to go inside this book and use it as a dictionary to define words for us. So let, I'm going to define for you what it means for God to be a gracious God. Because the root word for gracious is what? Grace. All right. So now we're back at Titus. New Testament. Read. Titus chapter 2 verse 11. Uh -huh. For the grace of God. The grace of God. The gracious God. Read. That bring us salvation. So grace. Sam. Grace is going to bring us salvation. So what is that grace? Read. Hath appeared to all men. Read. Teaching us that denying ungodliness. So the Bible says that grace teaches us to deny ungodliness. Sam. What is ungodliness? Anything that's unclean. Okay. Anything that's up, not of God. Okay. I'm all right with that. I'm all right with that. Ooh, you got that precept in Sarah? What you got? Uh, I can't remember. It's like chapter 40. But let's finish up Titus. Check this out. Titus chapter 2, verse 12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness with worldly lust. We should live soberly. So the scripture says that grace is going to teach us to deny ungodliness and to live soberly and to live what? Righteously. And to live righteously. So the Bible says that grace is going to teach us to live righteously. The Bible says that grace is going to teach us to keep God's commandments. That's what that means. Read. And godly in this present world. So we must live righteously and godly in this present world. So we truly believe that God is gracious. What does that mean? So, right, so if God has given you grace, 
what does that mean that he's giving you? No, he's giving you a time frame to live righteously, soberly in this present world. Say it again. Where did he send a comforter? This is the comforter, right? That's right. So what's the Holy Spirit? Then what is that? This is the Holy Spirit, right? Here. Oh, that's right. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit right here. Now I'm gonna explain that to you. That may be difficult for you to digest. That's not difficult. Okay. Okay. All praise. I'm gonna explain it anyway. But but let let me uh let me explain righteous real quick. Go go to uh Luke chapter one. Luke chapter one verse six. Because the Bible. The Bible says that grace teaches us to live righteously. And I just want the Bible, I wanted the Bible to define grace, and I also want the Bible to define righteous. I want the Bible to define righteous. Check this out. Luke chapter 1 verse 6, uh -huh. and they were both righteous. So grace is going to teach you to be righteous, and now let's read about righteous people. Before God, uh -huh. walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. There you go, right there. That's what it means to be a gracious God. It means that God has given you, Sam, one of my brothers, one of his sons, a time frame to start applying God's laws. Because there was a point in time where there was no grace. There was no mercy. There was only sacrifice. Give me uh, give me John chapter 1. That uh, mercy and truth came by Christ. And then go to uh, Acts chapter 13. I got you. I'm, I'm building on something right here. Give, give me John chapter 1. Like 16, 19 or something like that. 16, fullness of receiving. Yeah, verse 17. Check this out. John chapter 1 verse 17. For uh -huh. so the law is given by Moses. So the law was given by Moses. The laws of sacrifice, the laws of the priesthood, all these things that we read about, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Moses gave us those things. Read. But grace. But what? But grace. And that's what we're talking about right now, grace. So there was a difference when Moses was here versus when Christ came. Christ, I'm sorry, Moses gave the law, when Christ came, grace. Read. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And it's important for us to understand what that grace is because the Christian pastors, the Christian churches, like across the street, teach us that grace means I ain't got to do nothing. I don't have to keep God's laws anymore. I don't have to read the Old Testament. That was for back then. We in the New Testament now. But that's not the case. We just read in Titus that grace is to teach you to keep God's laws. Grace teaches you to live righteously, soberly, in this present world. Right. Okay. But it also tells us in Psalm 82, 6, that ye be all God. Explain that one to me. Explain what it means for us to be God? Okay. We are all God. Okay. So if we are all God, we should already be right. I'm going to give you some understanding. I don't want to understand the little G and the big G. I don't, don't go there. Okay. All right, Psalms 82 and 6. We got you. I'm going to make it real plain for you. Real simple for you. Check this out. Psalms chapter 82 verse 6. Uh -huh. I have said, ye are God, and all of you are children of the Most High. Uh -huh. But, ye so, key word, but. So you are gods. You were created to be gods. But, but, ye shall die like men. But you shall die like men. We weren't created to die like men. We were created to be a representation of the Heavenly Father here on earth. So everything he does in the heavens, we're supposed to do here on earth. That's what it means for us to be God. Right. But we've fallen from our God-like estate. That's why we were called sons of God back in Genesis. But I'm going to give you an example. Go to, uh, go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Genesis chapter 2. I might want verse 1. Check this out. Yeah, give me, uh, start at verse 1. Genesis chapter 2. So the scripture says that ye are gods. My brother said, well, what does that mean? Let's read about what God did. If we gods and our father is God, the most high God, tell me what this means. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. You got any children? No children? Okay. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God, who? God, who? God. So we gods, right? We gods, and now we're reading about God, the creator of gods, right? Check this out. God ended his work, which he had made. And look, the most high smiting his sister with me. 
not a sister, but smiting this heathen with madness right here. It's going to be way worse when Christ comes back. That's right. And he rested on the seventh day. Hey, but look. Hey, hey, uh, Sam. That's, that's Satan right there. I'm going to explain that to you, too. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Now the not one. 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 Not no, Let me give, give me Mark chapter 4 verse 15. I'm going to show you what happens when a brother or a sister is trying to receive the gospel from Christ out of the mouth of the prophet. Check this out. Mark chapter 4 verse 15. All these things uh, don't happen for, for, for no reason. Check this out. The book of Mark chapter 4 verse 15. And these are they by the wayside. So the scripture is given in a, uh, a parable. Christ is the sower. He sows the word. And sometimes the word falls by the wayside. Check this out, Sam. Where the word is sown. So the word is being sown to you right now. Read. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately. The scriptures say when you hear the word of this Bible, the true understanding, right after you hear it, Satan is going to come immediately. And we already got it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Satan's going to come immediately and do what? And take it away the word that was sown in their heart. Right. So the, Satan wants you to get distracted from this word. He wants you to get he wants you to get distracted from this word. Now go back to Genesis chapter two verse six. So the point that I was bringing out to you, the scripture says that we're gods, right? So we that means if we're the little G and there's a big G, whose example do we have to follow? Right, right. And this is what the big G did before the little G's came into existence. Read that again. The book of Genesis chapter 2 verse 2. And on the seventh day, God ended his work. So the scriptures say God ended his work. So if you want to be a God, what do you have to do on the seventh day? There you go. There you go. So God gave us all of his ways. He gave us his spirit. He gave us his laws. And if we want to be God, we have to follow his steps. You want the hospital? We have to follow his steps. Come on, baby. All right. You said no. You follow that? Yeah, I, I, I'm on point. I'm on point. So what do we have to do if we want to be God? Yeah. What I just read you the Sabbath thing. So if you want to be a God, you got to rest like the Most High God did on the seventh day. That's what you got to do. That's one of your first steps, all right? We used to scream black power while Heron was pushed. But at the end of the day, Nothing's in vain. IUIC has been given a vision. The tents of Judah has risen. Many has attempted the mission. Minor murmuring, omitting, and missing the mark. Just reading that he had the flame of fire in his eyes gave us the spark. We on Paul's mission. We out on the road, purple and gold. From Mexico, Cuba, Haiti, Ghana, Sierra Leone. 144,000 boots banging, concrete crackling. These are our men repented at heart. The scriptures is proof. IUIC, we deliver the truth.